Hello everyone and welcome back to Reentry, where I'm going to proceed with the Project Gemini lessons and let me tell you, nothing will give you more of an appreciation of the Gemini spacecraft than Reentry. Um, basically Apollo feels too big because it really needs to be managed by three people. Uh, Mercury feels too small and simple. Gemini is just sort of right. It feels right. So anyway, we've got lots to learn. It is not easy. In fact, these lessons are definitely not going to cover everything. Uh, we will want to be educated about many aspects of the Gemini missions eventually. I don't know if this covers EVAs, for instance. Uh, so I don't know why the exam is before maneuvering in burns. Uh, yeah, there's a lot to learn when it comes to Gemini. So let's get started. In fact, rendezvousing with Agena would be one of those things. I don't know if the lessons cover that or not. I forget. Okay, this lesson covers the final steps for preparing the Gemini spacecraft for launch. These steps include turning on internal power, setting up the computer, the squibs, and environmental control system. Okay, uh, the camera... I guess... I just want to see whether with the track IR I can s access things properly. Okay, let's go with this. Uh, this spacecraft is far more advanced than Project Mercury and contains more systems, including a computer. I will initially just explain the procedure and then highlight what you have to press. Use F5 to F11 to try the different views. Use the arrow keys and page up and down. Well, I've got the track IR. Uh, click and hold scroll wheel, etc. Uh, you can reassign input from the settings menu if you have it. Yep. Um, hopefully that's the same anyway. Uh, you'll learn how learn now as the pre-launch procedure. Okay, and then we can launch with the checklist later. Uh, right now, the spacecraft is powered by umbilical power, but once we lift off, we need to ensure that we are running on all the electric power we've got. In short, the spacecraft is dependent on two different electrical systems. First, we have four silver-zinc batteries connected in series inside the capsule itself. The other is a fuel cell system located in the adapter section, generating power from hydrogen and oxygen. The fuel cells are the primary power source. During launch for redundancy, we want to ensure that all of these systems are powered and operating. This is done by setting all main battery switches to on and all fuel cell switches to on. So. We'll go to the pilot's seat, and okay, pilot's panel. I, I really don't need the seat ones so much. I can look out the window without that. Okay, so down here, I'm really tilting my head down. Uh, all right, uh, let me just, okay, fine. They'll need me to, and, all right. Spacecraft has two fuel cells, each with three stacks producing power. More on this in the electrical systems section. Uh, this is our primary power source. Set fuel cell 1A to on. Uh, okay, where is that? Oh, there. Right. I've forgotten everything. That's why I have to do all these tutorials again. To see. And then power to fuel cell section. Number one. And number two. Okay. Uh, are those? Yeah, those are on. Uh, main DC bus is now powered by both systems. As in Project Mercury, the pyrotechnics are dependent on another isolated power system, the Common Controls bus. The system is powered by three silver zinc squib batteries and should stay on for the duration of the entire mission. Uh, these are turned on by setting the three squib battery switches on uh, to the on position. So those are here. Yep, that there. Okay, two flicks. Eek. The common control bus is now powered. The pyrotechnics are used to create controlled explosions to separate redundant rocket parts, staging, and to jettison components from it. For safety reasons, these, these systems need to be armed as well. To do this, set boost insert to arm. Uh, this arms all the squibs necessary during the launch and insertion parts of the mission. Um, okay, maybe... Okay, there it is. Okay, so that's on the commander's panel. Alright. 
For safety reasons, all the four rock yeah, retro rocket engines will also be set to arm during launch. Uh, this is to be able this is to be able to use the retro engine in case of emergencies. Never know when you need them. Uh, set retro squib to arm. I mean, we'll probably be going through all those. <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, next, we will turn on the onboard computer. The onboard computer is AC powered through the IMU and the main DC bus using an internal inverter. All that is needed to turn on the computer is to set the power to on. So, power on. When on, the computer needs 20, sel 20 seconds of self-tests. The computer display and keyboard is located on the pilot side. So, that. Both are turned on using the MDIU switch. Okay. You might see the computer self-test running, but the display should be set to zero when done. So I guess it's done. If not, you can press clear to reset the display. This can be pressed anytime and will not alter the memory. <laughs> While the computer is running the self-check, let's set up the environmental control system. In short, the cooling of the spacecraft is done by a liquid cooling system. Well, basically what's happening wrong with Soyuz at the moment. Uh, going through all our components. Using coolant, heat exchangers, radiators, and systems will stay cool. The spacecraft has two independent cooling systems. Using pumps, the coolant flows through these, flows through these systems. With the Soyuz that's elite coolant, I think it does not have two independent cooling systems. It has multiple cooling systems, but they're interconnected. Uh, set primary coolant pump 8 on. Uh, oh, up there, right. Uh, central pedestal or panel, panel. Okay, better. Okay, on and B on. And A on. And probably be on too. Okay, also set the suit fan to down one and two position, so that way. Right click further down. Okay, pay attention to the cabin temperature. There. Uh, it's uh, 115 degrees Fahrenheit. <laughs> and my suit's 96 according to that. The coolant pumps and fans will usually be on until adapter separation. Can we cool that down a bit more? I'm very sensitive to the heat. The computer needs to be turned on in the pre-launch mode. Once the self-check is complete, it can be started by pressing the start button. So presumably when it's all zeros over there, I don't know if there's any other light that needs to happen. So now it's green. When the computer is running in pre-launch, the computer will spend 30 seconds on aligning the platform. You can see the FDAI rotate to launch configuration. It's rotating there, that's the FDAI, the nav ball. It is important not to interrupt this process. There's, some, uh, there's a light sort of blinking in the background. Hmm. See? Off. If, if I turn my... anyway, let's not worry about that. Uh, the alignment will configure the roll program so it will roll correctly to reach a heading and a set target inclination. The procedures to change these parameters can be found in the flight manual. When the alignment is complete, configure the computer to prepare the ascent program. Uh, oh, central pedestal. Okay, this is preloaded into memory, so pre-launch is that one. And... Ascent is ascent. Uh, in general, if the computer light is green, the computer is working. If the malfunction light is amber, a reset is required. Let's go back to the central pedestal. Uh, so mouth there is if a reset is required. And then there's the reset button. Do not press this now, but if the computer light is not illuminated green during launch, uh, start it manually by using the start button. Okay, uh, all that's left is now is to let Mission Control know that you are ready using the radio command menu and click ready to launch. Barely on time, we're like 15 seconds. Well, the rocket will launch and ascend into orbit automatically. Feel free to look around. Okay, well, no! Okay, continue session. We'll go with launch. Ignition. 
let's see the external view. We don't have to like set the clock to zero or anything yet. They haven't told us anything about that. Oh, I guess we'll cover this in a different section anyway. They haven't talked about what I'm supposed to be doing right now anyway. Okay, um, end session. Okay, to make things more interesting, I've turned on the high resolution textures and it gave me a warning. The high resolution textures uh, option said you need six gigabytes of memory, but then it came up, when I activated it, it came up with a screen that said uh, you need 11 gigabytes of memory, so I don't know what kind of memory that is. It didn't say VRAM specifically. Reentry currently is not using that much. We will see if there's any issues. Of course, I will have made a bad decision on that. I think it might be thinking of RAM, uh, regular RAM. Okay, welcome back to Gemini Academy. In this lesson, we will learn how to ignite those engines of this 38 meter long Titan and ride it into orbit. Well, it took a while for the sky to appear. Let's take a look outside since I've made that change. Uh, well, we can't really tell much like this. We'll wait. We'll wait until we're over the Earth, and then we'll see. Okay. First, we need to repeat the steps we learned in lesson one. And however, instead of me telling you what to do, we will provide use the provided checklists. Okay. Checklist. Um, Pre-flight. Um, maybe full internal power. Let's see. Okay. Pre-flight. Okay. Run. All right. I'm just gonna go through it quickly. Let's get the batteries. Ah, come on, camera. Okay, fuel cells. Mm -hmm. Okay, you're in the way right now. Okay, we see the little stuff going up. Okay, commander's panel. Okay, back to pilot's panel. Okay, now it's working because we're within the 20 seconds where it does its work. Okay, back to commander's panel. Those are the retro and landing ones. Okay, and then to the center panel. And... And suit. Okay. Verify that the self-checks are complete, so it's all zero. Okay, yes. Ejection seat D-ring? They didn't tell us about that. Um, mount tool toggle D-ring. Hey! Toggle hatch? No. Where's the mount tool thing? Okay, well... Toggle D-ring is here. I don't know if that actually did the thing. Well, okay. Somehow, maybe. Computers start push. Okay, computer's working. Platform is aligning, I guess. Time scale will automatically stop for ignition. Okay, well, let's just go with that check mark. And that on ascent. Oh, uh, I think it might have been busy. Uh oh. <laughs> it was still green, right? Oh, wait. Hold on. Acme mode, rate command. Okay. Ohms open. RCS open. MDU 72. Okay. 
Um, I hear burbling. Where, where, what MDU-72? Is that this thing? Maybe it should have told us something. Well, we can't even do the radio check. Well, we didn't need to do MDU-72 apparently. Well, we're doing a roll program. We didn't do a ascent checklist, we didn't tell people we were ready. Hi, I'm ready to launch. <laughs> Lift off for Snoop B3. During launch, it is important to pay attention to your instruments. During the first 100,000 feet, start with the altimeter. Should be climbing steadily, one would hope. Uh, keep an eye on the fuel oxidizer indicator. For the current stage, the fuel level indicates the time left to this first staging. Uh, G forces normal to reach six Gs. Engine two at light is on. The attitude indicator can be used to see the direction. You start going up at 90 degrees pitch and slowly level with the horizon. Voltmeter on the pilot's panel. Uh, uh, is there to aid you in knowing your electrical systems are operating normally? If you have low voltage, something is wrong. I feel like something ought to be wrong after not actually completing the checklist, but okay. Um, cabin and suit temperature is also important to know if our system has the right temperature. If this gets too high or low, you need to fix it. It's too high! <laughs> I mean, didn't they think it would be too high if it's 115 degrees Fahrenheit cabin and 95 degrees suit temperature? I feel like I need to fix that. Cabin pressure and CO2 levels should be frequently monitored. Cabin PSI should leak and stabilize at 5.5. It's actually only at 5 right now. If CO2 is high, use cabin recirc to correct. It's one of those things up there. It might be one of these ring things. Okay, the Titan has two stages with an adapter in between. Speaking of which, let's see the staging. Getting down into the unusable fuel areas. Wonder how the external fuel. Did that look like a hot staging to you? Okay, we have staging. Okay. Building orbital speed. An important feature of the Gemini capsule is that it is equipped with translational thrusters in addition to attitude thrusters. You can monitor the stage 2 propellant state using that gauge, yeah. That gauge. This will give you an indication of how much more is, is left before you are in orbit. Once you reach orbit the computer, if it is running and is in the ascent mod module, or mold, mode, We'll calculate the distance left to enter the initial parking orbit based on the flight plan. plan. On the left side, just below the FDAI, you can see the IVI. Once stage 2 is complete, the computer will show you the difference between the three values there. Um, okay. We will do this once we have a successful stage 2 cutoff. Okay, let's see external view again. Since uh, it doesn't look like I've got bad performance, so I guess the high textures are fine. Uh, we're not really directly over land, but it's looking pretty good from this distance. With a little bit of a shader, I wonder if reshade would work with this. With a little bit of a shader, it might be interesting. Florida is looking better than Incredible Space Program, I'll say that. But yeah, I don't have any performance problems, so I'm guessing that I can use the high textures. We pitch down just a little bit, as is normal for these early rockets with their short stages. D-ring stow. Well, I don't even know what the state of the D-ring is. Okay, we have cut off. 
separate stage two. This is done manually by... Uh, let, let's just go through the checklist. Um, separate spacecraft. Luminated. Okay, what is luminated? By pressing the sequencer light. Oh, up there. Okay, let's go to the central panel. And it's not highlighting it, but I'll just put... Push. Okay, just in fairing push. Uh, well, hopefully that did that. Oh, that was supposed to be after I did ohms enable. It didn't say that down here. Okay. Isn't ohms enable down here? Why isn't that checklist actually highlighting stuff? Well, ohms is enabled. IVI is zero. It's funny that we zeroed the forward and aft before the left and right, even though I'm trying to do the left and right. Okay, I have zeroed out the IVIs. Plane changes are expensive and slow, and should ideally be done at the nodes. Yeah, we uh, we did not do it at the node. If the inclination has a value larger than 10, it means that the guidance in the launch vehicle has failed, typically because the inertial reference system did not get enough time to align before ascent. Well, we probably didn't give it enough time, but um, usually means a platform alignment step was forgotten. Forward aft labeled value modifies the altitudes of your orbit, perigee and apogee. Yeah, I mean, or just forward and backwards, yeah. To modify your orbit, we use ohms. I enabled ohms, and we... Receive propellant using prop motor valves, set ohms to open, enable power, control power, ohms, set it on. Um, that's what we flicked. I flicked that. Okay. Very important that you always disable ohm system directly after use to reduce the possibility of bumping into a tra translational joystick. Well, fine. Off. Okay. You can use a trans... Uh, I've already done all that. I, I zeroed them out anyway. <laughs> so, okay. Uh, we did the Ascent uh, tutorial. And we will move on. It's, it actually tells us our insertion altitude here. 122.3 nautical miles by 85.5 nautical miles with 32.56 degree inclination. So, we did actually make orbit. Uh, whatever I might have messed up on didn't hurt. All right, on to electricity, exclamation mark. I don't remember if it had an exclamation mark the last time I did it, but it has one now. Okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, the capsule is powered by two systems. The primary power source are two fuel cells that can generate power from hydrogen. Let me get the view selector and get back to the commander's panel instead of the window view. Okay. Um... Yeah, hydrogen and oxygen. Secondary is the four silver zinc batteries. We've gone through that. Uh, reactant supply system that supplies cryogenic uh, oxygen and hydrogen. Ionization of these substances produces electricity and water. The amount of reactant consumed is directly related to the power load on the fuel cell. Well, there you go. Let's make sure that we keep that low. Uh, the two fuel cells is are capable of running the spaceship alone, but since they're located in the adapter, they will be separated before the retrograde burn. From the retrograde burn to re-entry, the batteries will be used. The power sources can be configured using switches to the right panel next to the co-pilot. Not co-pilot, that's the pilot seat. <laughs> right, they don't like being called the co-pilot, I guess. Commander and pilot. Okay. Gosh. Let me sort of figure out how to position myself sometimes. 
Okay, there are two fuel cells installed. We've been through that before. You stack inside each fuel cell uh, on. You can turn each stack inside of each fuel cell on and off in case of a malfunction. Uh, typically on throughout the flight. Using the fuel cell stack gauges. <laughs> I, I probably should just turn the whole being able to roll my head thing off, huh? Uh, hold on. Um, that has not helped the situation. Okay, I, I don't know why. Okay, panel. Okay, um. Okay, let me just get rid of that. Alright. Fuel cell stack gauges. Yes, you can immediately see the load on each stack using the voltmeter. You can see the volts on each stack as well. If this is low on one of the stacks, you should shut it down in danger of uh, shut down in case of fire or explosion. Uh, you can use the DC voltmeter selector knob below the voltmeter to select which stack to monitor. Turn it to 1B now. Okay. Voltmeter will now display the state of the stack. It is important to include checking these as part of your monitoring routine. As mentioned earlier, the fuel cells are consuming cryogenic reactant. You can use the cryo gauge to monitor the RSS. It can be found in the middle section of the panel. There we are. And it is off by default, so turn the cryo selector knob uh, below it to H2 to see the state of the hydrogen cryo supply. The cryogenic system as a whole is involved is an involved and deep topic. Please refer to the Gemini flight manual for more details. The outer power source is the batteries. Uh, they, there are four batteries installed in the capsule. As mentioned, these can be turned on or off on the right side of the panel of the pilot seat. Both of these power sources are powering the DC main bus, or main DC bus, where most of the electrical components in the spaceship are connected to. It is normal to have both power sources connected to the main DC bus during launch and ascent. When inserted into an orbit, the batteries are usually turned off, leaving both fuel cells on. Other electrical power sources exist, or oh, another electrical power source exists. Uh, this is an isolated system. We've been through that for the squibs and all. Uh, three silver zinc batteries, usually on for an entire mission. Switches to arm them. Landing squibs are used for re-entry and the retro squibs for retro. Um, disarm the squibs when they're not uh, in use at all times to prevent accidents such as early staging. Each main battery has a test switch. These can be used to test the batteries. Using DC voltmeter selector, you can set it to battery test. So... Um, That's BT, battery test. When in BT mode, then you can then set the battery switch to test. Um, well, I guess that'll show me. And you will see the voltage of that individual battery. If the squib batteries should fail, you can use the bus tie switches to connect the main bus to the common control bus. It is easy to forget I, I don't know if they want me to do that. It is easy to forget that the batteries need to be turned on again before adaptive separation. A battery power telelight on the central panel will illuminate to remind you of this. And it's... Uh, um, it's not that one. Battery power, it's this one down here. Okay. Okay, that's enough for now. I'll refer to the manual for more details. Okay. Let's just move on. It's always better to figure these things out in a practical situation than just being told, though, of course. Stuff to retain it unless you're actually doing all the flicking. Loading the spacecraft takes a lot longer these days. Welcome to Guidance and Control. Uh, there are many systems involved to maneuver and navigate the Gemini spaceship. Don't worry if you feel overwhelmed. Once you start using these systems, it will quickly start to make sense as long as you understand the basics. I would recommend checking out the guidance and control section of the Gemini Flight Manual for more information. The spaceship can be controlled about pitch, roll, yaw axes, and can translate along longitude, vertical, 
and lateral axes. This means that the spaceship can alter the orbital path it travels in. Uh, we will dive deeper into orbital mechanics and in the orbital mechanics lesson. In this lesson, we will focus on how the spaceship can orient itself in space. In short, the propulsion system can receive firing commands and in the, is the system that actually fires the correct thrusters. The propulsion system receives commands from the at Attitude Control and Maneuvering Electronics, ACME. The ac ACME receives input from other systems. The other systems can be the hand controllers, the inertial guidance system, or the horizon scanners in the computer. The IGS provides an inertial platform used as a reference for the FDAI, which is the NAVBALL. The horizon scanners are used to track the orientation relative to Earth. Uh, to shield the sensors of the horizon scanners, covers protect them during launch and ascent. Once in space, the covers are jettisoned. The sensors are then exposed to space for the first time. They will require two minutes before being able to properly align the platform. Okay, there we go. Main interface to controlling the attitude. It can be configured using the attitude control selector set to direct. Okay. There are two main sets of thrusters installed. One is in the adapter and retro section and is named ohms. It is your primary attitude control system. Uh, another is the RCS system and that's in the capsule that's used during re-entry. Manual control can be obtained by setting the attitude control to either rate command, direct, pulse, and rate re-entry rate command. To be able to fire the ohm system using the stick controllers, you need to enable the ohm system. Let's do that now. Well, um, those need to be flicked as well. I'll let it tell me. Yep. Okay. Uh, that's just the, the RCS is the other ones. And enable controller power. Okay. Now with Acme set to direct, we already have it set to direct and ohms enabled, you can alter the attitude of the spacecraft using pitch, yaw, and roll. Okay, or I've got my control stick, of course. Let's see an external view, hopefully. Mm hmm Okay. So I've stopped it. I am yawing. Stopping the yaw. Rolling. And stopping the roll. Well, inside we can zero it out. There are markers for everything. To make sure the little yellow lines and then there's a dash on the top part. Yeah, okay, that's probably good enough. All right, so we basically zeroed that out. Also, try to set to rate command and pulse two to see the difference between the modes. Rate command will stop the rates if no input is given. Pulse will only fire the thrusters for 20 milliseconds with each deflection. So you can set a set amount. So rate command. So this is like SAS. And so it'll zero it out immediately. You can see the yellow lines stopping it. Okay. And then pulse is not that one. Up, up. Okay, so very small bursts. Platform is used. Okay, back to the center pedestal. All right, platform, which is down here, uh, is used to let the IGS control the spacecraft. It's very handy if you need to attend to other tasks and can be thought of like an autopilot. So set it to platform, or plat. Then set the IGS mode above to SEF. This stands for sharp and forward. Okay, so it's there, sharp and forward. And that's prograde. So there's totally like those little things on SAS that orient you automatically. Um, okay. As you can see, the spaceship will now try to move in the prograde direction. The attitude can be read using the FDAI and uh, 
there are two of these installed in the spaceship, one for commander and one for pilot. Each can be configured individually. Uh, set the commander's FDAI source to platform. Oh, I can barely... Okay, what was the... Mm, I forgot the key for the flashlight. Oops. Okay, it is on platform, isn't it? Yeah. This will tell the system that we want to receive signals from the platform. Then set the data that we want to see to attitude. Okay, this will set the guidance needles to show where we would point in a given situation. Like, SEF will guide you to the direction you should point. Okay. It will guide you to the direction you should point to be in pro... Prograde B, okay. SEF is prograde BF, but in forward is retrograde. Um, I, I think it's supposed to be blunt, but whatever, but in forward. Uh, rate will show the angular rates you are currently rotating at, uh, and mix will combine them. The FDAI set knob on the FDAI itself will set the sensitivity of the needles. You can see the amount of propellant. That's the propellant for the various propulsion systems using the prop gauge with the selector knob below it. Set the selector to ohms to see the propellant in the ohm system. Okay. Good job. Feel free to play around with the various systems to test things out. And that's the end of that lesson. Okay, we've got a lot of lessons though. It doesn't. It didn't check out complete the lesson though. Hey, uh, hold on. Continue session. Roger. Uh, and it still didn't check complete the lesson. Hey, <laughs> I completed the lesson. This one says completed. Okay, it says completed anyway. Okay, uh, for this video, I'll finish up with the computer, which is involved anyway. Okay, welcome to the computer lesson. The computer is used as a navigation aid throughout the mission. It is a binary fixed point stored program general purpose computer. It uses input from many of the other systems in the spaceship. An auxiliary tape memory system, so it, it, I just pointed to that computer thing. And then we'll go over to the pilot's panel where we have the that me computer memory system. Typically, each phase of the mission has a de dedicated module. The computer is controlled using the computer section in the center pedestal. The on-off switch gives the computer power. The mode switch uh, is used to select which module to run. The start button will start the computer when a module is loaded. Uh, the lo loading take can take up to 10 minutes with the exception of the pre-launch module and the ascent module. They are loaded instantly. Aux tape run light indicator on the pilot panel, right seat panel. Um, where is the aux? Well, it's a light indicator. Um, shows if the tape is running, meaning a module is loading. It is not possible. Um, wish they had highlighted that one. Aux tape. Anyway, it is not possible to start the computer when a module is loading. If the computer should fail, mouth will illuminate. Well, uh, mouth. Uh, if this happens, you can reset the computer using the reset button. When a module is loaded, you need to press start to start running the computer or perform calculations. The computer is controlled and modified by checking and changing memory values directly. That's on the MDIU, annual data insertion unit. To visualize data in a memory core, or what you wish to insert into a core, you can use the display. It needs to be turned on. Well, it is set on on. Okay. Let's try to operate the computer. Turn the computer itself on by setting the power switch on the center pedestal to on. It is ready. Okay. It will set, uh, it was already on, so it's not gonna do self tests. Okay, it will revert to zero. It has reverted to zero, so we can go to... Oh, that was ascent. Okay. Now if everything ready, press start. I'm pretty sure it was already started, but okay. Well, now it's working and everything. 
Wow, 360 feet per second off in the direction. Okay, well, we will check what our current orbit is using the computer. This display unit has two address digits and five data digits. Address is what your computer, what the computer memory address you want to check or modify. Data is the value. So 98 is the apogee. 9, 8. And press readout. So the apogee is 6,594 kilometers. That's from the center of the Earth, though. And we can... Well, clear. 99, read out 6526. Core 56 and 57 is used to see the target orbit we want to achieve. This can be set during the mission to help you get into a new orbit. Okay, 56. So 6532 is the perigee. Clear. Uh, I already did that. That was what it was. Now the zero, the input pointer is still in the first digit of the message. Oh, okay. Oh, I, I think it wanted me to change what it was. Oh, okay, so they wanted that. All right, fine. 50, okay, so clear. 56. Zero. They're resetting. Uh, setting a different uh, perigee. Okay. Let's enter. Okay, now we have stored that value. Please note that the computer will automatically set the inserted value to AP or PE based on if it's higher than the other value. If AP is 5670 and you set PE to 5680, 5680 will go into the AP instead and 5670 will become the PE. So this is how you operate the computer. I strongly recommend you check the computer section of the Gemini flight manual to understand in detail what all the modules do and what each memory core means. There's a lot of addresses but okay and their manuals are on their website so Complete the lesson still is unchecked. <laughs> okay, anyway. So we've completed the first five tutorials and then we'll proceed in the next video with the rest of it and do a full mission. So, yeah. So that will be the next video. Thank you for watching. Hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please do press like. If you have any comments or suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below. And I will see you next time.